morning. Welcome to Hope City Church. It's so good to be together. And we are in the book of Colossians. We're going through this book a section at a time. And it's so good for us not to just look at our favorite portions of scripture, not to just look at our favorite topics, but to go through every now and then a book at a time to make sure we're getting the whole counsel of God. So we're in part two this week and we are in Colossians chapter one, verse 15 to 23. Let's read it together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. This is such a rich portion of scripture. It's so deep we could spend probably two months going through um, what Paul wrote to this church at Colossae. And I'm going to go through kind of bullet points to Carto, the first nine points, and probably each of them could easily be a sermon in their own right. And then I'm going to get on to point 10 and get a little bit deeper this morning about our faith. And so this morning's title is Continue in the Faith, from that phrase in one of the verses. So the first point this morning is that Jesus is the perfect representation of God. In fact, Paul says, all of God's fullness dwelt in Him, in Jesus. And so we know that whenever we read in the Gospels Jesus, when we see His character, His nature, His teaching, what He does, it's a representation of God the Father. In fact, one of the disciples asked Jesus once, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus said, well, don't you know me? I've been among you this whole time. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what Jesus was saying is he reveals God the Father through his actions, through his words, through his teachings, through his miracles. He, when we look at him, we see the heart of God portrayed. Now, now God is infinite and we'll never know all there is to know, but whatever Jesus has revealed, and whatever we see in Scripture is a true reflection of, of who God is. Jesus is the representation of God's being. Secondly, Jesus made all things. It says, by him all things were made. We're not quite sure how he made all things, but we know that he has made all things. John chapter 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So in the beginning, when God made the heavens and the earth, Jesus was there, partnering with God in making all that we see around us, the universe, the world, our planet, etc. Jesus made all things, which means He's powerful, which means He existed before the world existed. Thirdly, all things were made for Jesus. In other words, He is the reason that we exist, that we we were made, the earth was made, the solar system was made, the universe was made for Jesus. We exist to bring Him glory. We exist to bring Him honor. We were made for Him. Number four, Jesus is before all things. He's before all things. That means that He is the start of. Before any thought was had by a human there was God, there was Jesus. He's the beginning of the procession, if you like. He is before all things. 
means he's superior. Number five, Jesus holds all things together by his powerful word. And this is really important because not only does he keep the earth spinning on its axis, not only does he keep the planets in our solar system going around, not only is he the invisible force behind all those subatomic particles and the Higgs boson and, and gravity and antimatter and all those things, not only is he the, the force that keeps everything together, but he's also the one who sustains, who holds us together. When we are going through difficult times, Jesus sustains, he holds together all things by his powerful word. So, so God can speak to our hearts and give us a supernatural peace and sustain us and hold us together. He's the one we look to, to make sure we don't fall apart <laughs> when things get really out of hand. So Jesus is a good one to go through. Number six. Jesus is the head of the church, which means that uh, that word head doesn't mean dictator. It means leader and the source of life. Jesus is our leader. He goes out in front of us as the church. He's leading us in, in triumphal procession, the Bible says. But he's also the life source. The life that we have, the supernatural life of God that flows in us, comes from Jesus. We don't make it up ourselves. We don't try in our own strength to build the church. No, no, no. Jesus is leading us. He sustains us. He gives us His life by His Spirit. That we can go forward as the church, boldly advancing the kingdom and what He's called us to do. He's the head of the body, the church. Number seven, Jesus is preeminent, which means that He is supreme. He is above all things. No one can compare to one of my favorite prayers that I pray for myself is, Lord Jesus, thank you that you are seated on your throne, supreme, preeminent, unhindered, and unchallenged in his power. None can compare to him. He's unlike anything else. He is supreme. He is preeminent. It's a beautiful description. Number eight, Jesus reconciled to himself all things through his death on the cross. And that's really important for you and I because at one point Paul says that we were aliens, we were hostile, we were doing evil things. And yet even when we were doing evil things, Christ died for us. He reconciled us, he brought us back to God by his death. He was punished, he died a sinner's death, though he was innocent, so that me, a sinner, could go free. He paid a debt that he didn't know that I could go free from a debt I could never pay. He reconciled to himself us by his death. Number nine, I love this one. Jesus presents us to God now and one day when we get to heaven, holy blameless and above reproach he presents us to god holy blameless and above reproach and that is amazing because i don't know about you but but i've done some pretty bad things in my life i've thought some pretty terrible thoughts i've got some pretty wicked motives and yet god presents us he takes us into the father jesus takes us to the father and says here is my son here is my daughter holy blameless above reproach because of what i've done we get the righteousness of christ credited to us it's amazing it's amazing and what i want to focus on this morning is and expand on is this point where paul says continue in the faith not shifting from the hope that is the result of the gospel that you heard continue in the faith now I was in the shower the other night and this thought kind of crossed my mind that our faith is not validated or invalidated by a certain outcome of a situation. Just because you have faith for something, just because you prayed for it, just because you trusted for God, but you didn't see the answer you hoped for, that outcome of that situation 
doesn't invalidate your faith that caused you to trust God and caused you to pray. Our faith grows, our faith increases as we hear God's word. It grows and increases when we step out in faith and we see God answer our prayers. Our faith grows when we hear the testimony of other people when God's done something in their lives. Faith grows in all kinds of ways. But faith doesn't need a favorable outcome or what we think is the right outcome to be valid or validated. Some of you, and me included, we've prayed for sick people and we haven't seen them healed. We've prayed for certain circumstances and there's been no change. We've prayed for breakthrough in relationships or in finances or in our business and like nothing seems to happen. And we kind of think, well, is my faith invalid because there wasn't the outcome I prayed for? No, I don't think so. Many of us are praying, Lord, please protect me. Please protect my family from the coronavirus. What if we get the coronavirus? Does that invalidate our faith and trust in God and, and praying prayers like Psalm 91 to protect us? I would say no, it doesn't invalidate our faith. And I want to give you two scriptures to kind of show that. James chapter 2, verse 22 the writer James is, is talking about Abraham, the father of our faith, and how faith and action go together. And he says in verse 22 of James chapter 2, You see that faith was active along with his works. This is talking about Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac. His faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. In other words, his faith was made complete by what he did, not by the outcome. His faith was completed by his action, by his obedience, by his response to God and what God said, not by the outcome of the situation. It was completed by his action, it was made whole, it was perfected by his action. Another example Hebrews 11, 6 says that without faith, we can't please God. It's a wonderful chapter, Hebrews 11, because it's like the heroes of our faith. And so without faith, we can't please God. And then the writer goes on and, and kind of describes some of the heroes of our faith and what they did. And by faith, Moses did this. And by faith, Daniel did this. And by faith, by faith, by faith. And then the end of the chapter, verse 13, says... These all died in faith, not having received what they promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. And so these heroes of our faith who, who lived by faith and pleased God their faith, many of them died in faith, having not received what was promised. But having seen what was promised from far off and greeted it, said hi to the promise, but, but never quite got there to realizing it and living in it. And yet they pleased God with their faith. Their faith was still valid, even though the outcome, even though the promise hadn't materialized in their day. And so Paul encourages us in Colossians 1 to continue in our faith. Why? Because faith pleases God. It's a really good thing. And this faith that pleases God is kind of in two aspects. It's faith for our salvation, faith and belief and trust in Jesus' death on the cross and receiving that for our salvation. And faith that we could live every day by faith. I think Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, we live by faith. That's how we live every day. We know that our faith can do extraordinary things. Jesus said, faith as small as a mustard seed can move a mountain. And so we call sometimes to move mountains. We call to demonstrate the kingdom of God. We call to bring heaven to earth as disciples. And Jesus taught us to pray. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, Whatever's going on in heaven, 
Lord, let those things happen here on earth. We want to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth. And that's what we're called to do. It requires our faith. And there are some amazing people and some wonderful churches all over the world who are really good at this, growing and, and living out this kingdom and, and bringing the supernatural and miracles and signs and wonders and healings. And we need to learn from these men and women and incorporate their faith and, uh, and learn from them and grow in this area. But there is an interesting tension that we find ourselves in sometimes. We, we're living by faith. We, we trust in God for His intervention, His supernatural power. And yet sometimes we find that the outcome isn't what we hoped, isn't what we prayed for. And this could be for a whole bunch of reasons and we get stuck and hung up on trying to figure out why a certain thing didn't happen a certain way when we prayed or we stepped out in faith or we did something. Perhaps God had a different outcome in mind. Perhaps the version we prayed for was what we wanted. It was a bit selfish. It was a bit proud, prideful. But we can't let the outcome of a situation impact our faith, impact our devotion to God, impact our serving of His church, His bride. Why? Because faith is not invalidated by an outcome. Sometimes we do things, sometimes we pray things, sometimes we live and we greet the promise far off because we're living in faith and the generation after us will receive what we've contended for and strived for and worked for in God. And our faith, we know, isn't in man, not in the church. It's in Jesus, the one we read about in Colossians 1, the one who's supreme, the one who's the image of the invisible God. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. And so it's right for us to be encouraged to pray for miracles, to pray for healing. And if I think how the Bible kind of treat sick people. In the Old Testament, uh, you kind of were excluded. You were kind of secluded. You were kind of put to one side. If you had leprosy, you'd go out the camp. Jesus, and in the New Testament, they cared for the sick. They prayed for the sick. And that's what we want to do. We want to be practical in this difficult time with the coronavirus. And if you are sick in any way, if you contract the coronavirus, if you have to self-isolate for any reason, and you need some care or some prayer, please let us know. We want to be able to care for you, but we can't do it if we don't know about you. So please get hold of your life group leader, chat to one of the leaders in the church. If you know someone who's in that boat, that they can't go out shopping, etc., we'd love to go and buy them groceries. We'd love to drop them off. We'd love to pray for them over the phone. We'd love to care for them as best that we can. So please help us do that. We should pray for the sick. We should stand firm on God's word. If I think of Psalm 91, it's a beautiful psalm. Many have been reading it and meditating on, on praying it. It would be wrong for me to say to all of us that if we all recite this psalm three times a day, then we are going to be completely protected. We're not going to get the coronavirus. It would be wrong for me to say that. Now, God may tell you or someone else specifically, if you read the psalm three times a day, I will protect you. I won't let this plague come near your family. And that's cool because that's God speaking to you specifically about that particular thing. Because He wants to grow you in your faith of hearing Him, in your faith of obeying Him, in your faith of trusting for protection. But that doesn't mean that the outcome is automatically the same for everyone who does the same as what you do, if that kind of makes sense. But everyone can read this psalm often and pray it and trust God in faith and stand in His Word and live by faith. And even if we do get the coronavirus, our faith can still be pleasing to God because our faith and our pleasing of God doesn't depend on the outcome. It depends on our obedience. It depends on our response to God. And friends, we need to be free. We can't live in condemnation. We can't live in guilt because, 
Well, so and so prayed Psalm 91 and they didn't get sick. But I prayed Psalm 91 and I did get sick. And then I think, what have I done wrong? Is God judging me? But friends, we can't live in guilt. We can't live in condemnation. We must be free. It's our faith that pleases God. We live by faith, not by outcome. We trust God for more healings. We trust God for more outcomes in line with heaven. Not in line with what man thinks, in line with heaven. So we trust for that. We, we live by faith. So what do we do when things seem so uncertain? When the situation and the circumstances around us are, are changing at, at work this week, we discussed as a management team, what do we do if someone tests positive in our facility? Are we going to close the whole, whole place down for the sake of all the other employees? And then if we all come back two weeks later and then someone else tests positive, what do we do? And so we, as a management team at work, we are grappling with these kinds of things. But the situation is changing every day. How do we live when things are so uncertain? Well, we continue in our faith, as Paul writes to the church in Colossae. Our faith in God, the one who's outside all of this, the one and the only one who is above, who is unchanged by our unchanging world. We continue in our faith in Jesus. That's the key message. Chris. Valaton said this this week, and I love this quote. He says, when we can't trust the journey, we got to trust the tour guide. <laughs> Many people, we don't know what's going to happen next week, the week after, the month after. We don't know how the economy is going to respond. We don't know if my company will survive. What will our finances look like in three months' time if the worst happens with this pandemic? What happens sometimes in our lives is seasons where God's word is a lamp to our path. And we see the whole path. We see the whole journey and we, wow, we get excited. We can follow easily because we see the whole path. Other times, His word is a lamp to our feet. We only see the next step. And so we can't trust the path because we don't see the whole path. And so we don't see the whole journey. So when we can't trust the journey... But because we can't see it, we've got to trust the tour guide. We've got to trust our relationship with God. Our faith must be in Him for the next step, for our peace, for our security. One way to do this is by looking back at what God has done. Looking back in the Bible and seeing who God is. Because He's the same as He was then, as He is today. He's still faithful. He's dependable. He's unchanging. He's all-powerful. He's supernatural. He intervenes. He loves us. He knows all the details of our lives. It's the same God. So our faith can be rooted in Him when we know who He is. When we see what He's done in history. When we see what He's done in our lives. If I look at Hope City Church, what He's done in the last two weeks. The gambling place next door has moved out. God's doubled the size of our facility Given us a whole bunch more chairs. How good is God? We mustn't miss the obvious. God is at work. We can have faith in Him. We can be secure in what He's doing. He wants to fill them. I don't know if you've ever had this kind of thing happen to you where you embark down a road, you start down a journey, you start investigating something or a ministry, and as you go a bit deeper down the road, you suddenly realize, well, God's already there. <laughs> You're kind of hoping God will show up, but actually He's been there from before you started that journey. And uh, I was eating an apple this week, right? And as I got to the core on the one section, I kind of eat around the core. And as I bit it open, I had a look at, and I could see one or two of the pips. And as I looked, I saw a root coming out of one of the seeds. It had started growing and germinating before it had been planted. And I was like, man, God, there's got to be some point to this. There's got to be something in this random kind of act of a seed germinating before it's planted. And actually, life is there sometimes before it's planted. I don't need to plant that seed and wait weeks for it to germinate and grow. It's already growing. And sometimes God accelerates things in our lives where there's just growth and life. Before we even think we need to plant it, God's already there. He's shown up doing something. 
It's so encouraging. The activity in the life of God is already growth. So we can continue in the faith. We can look back at what God's done. Another thing we can do is we can watch how we speak. Remember when the Israelites came out of Egypt through the Red Sea. They got to the border of Canaan, the promised land. They sent out 12 spies, one from each tribe. And they all went in together as a group, social distancing included. <laughs> and they went to spy out the land. And they saw and they came back and 10 of them gave a report that was a fearful report. They'd seen the same things, the fruit, the land flowing with milk and honey and the giants. They said, we, we can't get in because there are giants. And Joshua and Caleb were two, the only two who had a faith-filled report. They spoke in faith. They saw the same giants. They saw the same fruits. But they said, actually, God is for us. He's called us to take the land. We can surely do it. And so friends, inheritance, by the way, only Joshua and Caleb, out of that whole generation, made it into the promised land and received their inheritance. And so inheritance, our inheritance, starts with how we speak. It starts with our words. Why? Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. We want to be able to take as a church and as people, every bit of the promised land that God wants to give us. And it starts with speaking in faith about our situation, about our circumstances. And there are going to be many benefits, many opportunities coming out of this coronavirus. It's devastating for economies and, and people and families and not downplaying the effect it's having. But there's going to be some benefits. Staying at home with your kids a whole lot longer. Life, the pace of life slowing down. New ways to invent and live out our community as believers and as people. It makes relationships a whole lot more meaningful. This new way that we're going to have to live, etc. There's going to be opportunities, friends. We're going to speak in faith. It's not doom and gloom. Why? Because God's on the throne. He's preeminent. He's sovereign. He's supreme. And this season that we're living through is going to require us to change. Change how we live, how we think, how we act. And more, I think, for the sake of others than for our own sake. We've got to do the social distancing thing. We have to do self-isolation if we come into contact with anyone. We've got to keep washing our hands, etc. We've got to stay at home if we have a sore throat or a cough or a fever. We've got to cough differently, you know, into our elbow. <laughs> It's mightily inconvenient, I might add, but we're doing it for the sake of others. So I have three kids, and it's not that often that I get to go to bed early, and not that often that I, I get to go to bed early and not have to set an alarm. And that happened on one day this week, and twice during the night, I had to get up for my kids, one with a minor nosebleed and one who had wet their bed. And I was so upset because I'm like, oh, I got to bed early and now I'm woken up and my sleep is interrupted and I have to get up again. And then like, it was just like a complete wreck. And what I realized later in that day is that I'm actually glad for that inconvenience. I'm happily and happy to be inconvenienced, interrupted for the sake of my kids because I love them so much and I, I want the best for them. chose to look after little people so it comes with territory i guess happy to accept all those things and god calls us this gospel calls us to make sacrifices that will inconvenience us that will interrupt our lives for the sake of others and so as a church we should be prepared friends to go and care for others if god leads us in that way to share our homes to share our lives to share our hearts to share our our finances with others, interrupting our lives, being inconvenienced for the sake of us because God's called us to love other people. And that's His word to us. So I hope that's helpful this morning as we think of the book of Colossians and put it in context with our world that actually we need to look to Jesus to sustain us, to hold us together, and that we trust in Him and who He is for every step of this journey. So, 
I hope you're praying for our country. I hope you're praying for our nation, for our healthcare workers. I hope you're praying for the guys developing the vaccine. Lord, let them do it supernaturally quickly. Let them be able to produce it en masse in weeks and months rather than in years that they predicted. Lord, let there be a breakthrough in technology because of the time scale of what's happening here. Lord, would you heal? Lord, would there be amazing things coming out of this for your glory, for your kingdom? Ultimately, all things work together for the good of those who love him. So, Father, thank you for what you're going to do. Strengthen us, give us courage, fill us with your spirit, and help us to take this love and this gospel all over the world. Amen. God bless.